I'm sorry. We don't have time for it. Let me ask you a question. On the 30th hour. That's my question. I have yet. The Democratic leader. This is is unbelievable. You know what the American people are thinking right now, Mr. President? They're thinking that this country was founded by geniuses. But it's being run by a bunch of idiots. With the jobs of millions on the line, Washington squabbles and doctors continue to sound the alarm. In New York City, the American epicenter of the coronavirus emergency, there is concern that there may only be enough supplies to last a few days. This is the World Health Organization says it took 67 days for coronavirus cases to reach 100,000 cases, 11 days for 200,000 cases, and just four days to reach 300,000 cases. Yet over the weekend, we witnessed scenes like this, people in parks, people boating on the water, even and taking hikes. As more of America shuts down, people are clamoring to get out. We'll take a look at how our personal freedoms have been impacted and what could lie ahead, because after all, we are all in this together. Good evening, everyone. I'm Lindsay Davis. Thanks so much for streaming with us. Congress is bickering, markets are faltering, and the city that never sleeps is on bed rest, at least for now. This was the scene in Times Square today, normally the busiest part of New York City. Now the empty crossroads of a pandemic and just blocks away a transformation at the Javits Convention Center. The goal is to turn it into a 1,000-bed hospital complex. The first phase is expected to be up and running by next week. Huge pallets of supplies shipped in, just one of several bright spots in our midst. For more on that, we go now to our Tom Yamas, who leads us off from New York, the new epicenter of the outbreak. Tonight, the battlefield in the war on the coronavirus expanding. New York's Javits Center, the city's convention facility, now being turned into a hospital. Hospital beds and ventilators being delivered. The National Guard on site. The goal here, to house 1,000 patients. Governor Andrew Cuomo ordering all hospitals to increase capacity by 50%. There are more than 20,000 people infected with coronavirus in New York. This is going to get much worse before it gets better. The Pentagon also reading 10 field hospitals capable of holding a total of 1,550 beds. At least two of them will arrive within 72 hours to Seattle and New York. And the situation in New York worrying other states. The governor of Florida taking a drastic measure, issuing an executive order mandating anyone flying in from New York or New Jersey to do a mandatory self-isolation for 14 days. Hopefully that will be a deterrent for people if you're just simply trying to escape here uh, to avoid the restrictions that have been put in place in your own state. That is probably not a good idea. New York City now the epicenter of the pandemic in the U.S., Cuomo announcing his state will move forward with trials for a new drug therapy, the same one pushed by President Trump. 10,000 doses of the anti-malaria drug hydroxychloroquine coupled with Zithromax, also known as a Z-Pak. Its effectiveness still unproven. We have a lot of very sick people right now in hospitals all over the place. And speaking with the governor, New York, Cuomo, I said, uh, how's it look? He's got a lot of sick people. And treating those sick people is leading to a shortage of supplies in some cases. We're short on PPE that a lot of folks are short on around the country. Masks, um, face shields. We're filling up our ICUs. We have uh, several floors now that are devoted only to COVID positive patients. The chief of surgery at Columbia University warning in a memo to staff that the hospital is burning through 40,000 masks every day when on a normal day they use 4,000. Cornelia Griggs is a mother of two. She's a pediatric surgeon at that same hospital. We're running into potentially crisis situations. Having to make the split second decision, am I going to run into this room to save this patient or Am I going to take the time to try and scramble and find a mask? Governors calling on the federal government to push manufacturers to make needed supplies, something the president said days ago he was prepared to do. They legally have a tool called the Federal Defense Production Act. Use it. Across the country, companies big and small doing what they can to help. These are our medical gowns that we've been making here at Coleman Knitting Mills. Coleman Knitting Mills in Utah is taking fabric from cheerleading uniforms to make gowns and masks for a nursing home group in Washington State. 
and testing for coronavirus still a problem in so many parts of the country. In New Jersey, some drivers turned away from a new drive through testing facility before it even opened this morning. In Miami, long lines at a new testing site at Hard Rock Stadium, where the Miami Dolphins play. There, the National Guard was giving tests to people 65 and older showing symptoms. A growing number of states now ordering residents to stay home. But overnight, the president signaling he's getting impatient, tweeting, we cannot let the cure be worse than the problem itself. At the end of the 15-day period, we will make a decision as to which way we want to go. Late today, the president doubled down. America will again and soon be open for business, uh, very soon, a lot sooner than uh, three or four months that somebody was suggesting. Our Tom Yamas joins us now. Tom, as you know, cases continue to surge more than 500 dead in the U.S. and 42,000 sickened. But turning back to the American epicenter here in New York, break down for us how this transformation at the Javits Center will work. What types of treatments will patients there receive? Right, Lindsay. Well, they expect to have about a thousand hospital beds here. They're going to have four facilities, facilities just like this all around the state. Essentially, at first, they plan on putting patients here that are essentially overflow patients, patients that don't have COVID-19. But if situations get very dire, they are ready to convert this facility also into a coronavirus hospital to treat patients here if need be. Of course, Andrew Cuomo and other governors across the state are preaching that things are bad now. They're going to get even worse in the future, and they're trying to plan for that now instead of later. And Tom, explain for us that new news that we just learned regarding travelers from New Jersey and New York trying to get to Florida. Yeah, you know, this is still such fresh news, and I've been making a lot of calls down to Florida. I have a lot of friends and family down there. I used to work down there. Essentially, Governor DeSantis, and he said this earlier, he says that he believed people were traveling from New York and bringing the coronavirus to Florida. So now he's issued an executive order saying anybody traveling from New York and New Jersey into the state of Florida will have to self-isolate for 14 days. But there are big questions tonight, Lindsay. Are, is law enforcement going to meet these travelers at the gate? Are they going to be put in quarantine in a separate facility? Are they going to have to do it with themselves? What happens to people that are driving in? Can they check every single car? A lot of questions tonight, but no doubt he is sending a message to the state of New York and really across the country that as things get serious, some states essentially are going to sort of close off their borders, if you will. Yeah, loud Lindsay? message indeed. Tom Yamas, thanks so much for that. We need more. Those are the words constantly being touted by healthcare professionals at the front lines here and across the globe. Joining us now is Dr. Darian Sutton, who's an emergency room physician here in New York City. Doctor, thanks so much for joining us. Hi, good evening. How are you? I am well, hanging in there as all of us are. So let's get straight to it. Do you and your hospital have what you need in terms of personal protective equipment or PPE? I mean, how prepared is your hospital? So the answer is no. Um, the amount of N95 masks that have been circulated, unfortunately, are simply just not enough. Um, we're finding that we're using N95 masks on a weekly basis when they normally are used for one patient interaction. So we're already at the point where we're stretching our resources. Now, we haven't hit the worst of it yet. I mean, hospitals are already saying that they're out of equipment. Are systems just not set up for scenarios like the one that we're facing? So that's a great question. We often set up for emergency system, uh, emergency events, such as mass casualty incidents. Um, every ER is set up in a way where we can facilitate. But this is a situation where we're going through a mass casualty incident every single day. Um, a lot of people will reference other prior um, infections or outbreaks, uh, such as SARS in 2003. But the simple reality is, is that this pandemic of the COVID-19 virus uh, far, far, far outweighs uh, the effects of such viruses such as SARS. So it's a simple re reality that we just did not have the capacity to store the amount necessary to treat this many people. Now, some doctors in Italy have warned over the weekend that they were growing concern that hospitals were becoming a place of transmission back into communities. Is that something that we should be thinking about? And what's your advice to patients who want to go to hospitals in New York who don't have COVID issues? Yeah, so I, I hear that, and I, I, I will say as a physician, I'm always concerned about that. We've made precautions in many different ERs that I've spoken to my colleagues around New York City. We've tried to establish zones where we have patients who are high risk for the likely diagnosis of COVID-19 and other zones for patients who have other emergencies like strokes 
heart attacks, other issues that are happening still, regardless of disinfection. Um, the reality is, is that as time goes on, uh, everyone is going to be exposed. Um, we're trying our best. But what I would say to people who are coming into the emergency room is really ask yourself whether or not you need to be there and realize that you're stepping into a place that has a high risk of exposure to COVID-19 if you don't already have it. Um, so what I like to inf uh, inform people is utilize other resources like telehealth and urgent care or even calling the ER and talking about your symptoms to a nurse or a provider, and you'd probably be better equipped to understand what you're getting into. And tell us a little bit about the types of cases that you're seeing, especially when it comes to young people who, as we saw over the weekend, some of them seem to think that they're immune. Yeah, and I, I have to say that I, I thought the same. I thought the <clears throat> same when I was looking at the initial data and statistics that were coming from China. I thought that this was a disease that was really just limited to those who are over 60 or those who had chronic conditions. But the reality is, is that I'm not seeing that. I'm seeing with patients coming in in their 30s or 40s, who are requiring significant interventions, requiring oxygen and intubations, um, and having significant pneumonias that are making them symptomatic. Um, I can say that from the reports, as far as the CDC goes, the mortality outcomes are still very low for those under the age of 40. But we're still doing these procedures and interventions that are needed for these people who are, in my mind, um, young and should never really be in the ER. Now, a point that can't be stressed enough is the need for social distancing and flattening the curve. We keep hearing that, right? But are there levels to this? Is going out for a leisurely run something that people should be avoiding at this point? I saw a bunch of people at Central Park on Friday, you know, kind of squished together uh, on park benches. People are still going out, and they're still kind of in close proximity to each other. Yeah, so I would inform people, uh, first off, the definition of social distancing is that you want to uh, basically retain your family unit. So that means that if you live within a small uh, space with your roommates, for example, it doesn't mean that you should invite another apartment over because that, in effect, is inviting two family units together. And that's inappropriate if you're trying to follow the rules of social distancing. As far as going out for a run, I think that's completely okay. However, if you notice that you're in a space of a high population density, you need to find an exit and get out because you're going to be exposed inevitably. Or if you have asymptomatic COVID, you're going to expose someone else vulnerable. So what I try to inform people is stay safe, um, um, be aware of the surroundings around you. And if some place is crowded, avoid it. Dr. Sutton, thank you so much for your time and your insight. We really appreciate that. Of course. Thank you so much, Lindsay. And let's turn now to Washington, which is consumed in gridlock over the passage of a massive $2 trillion stimulus package to boost an economy shut down by this virus. Democrats blocking two votes in the Senate today, claiming that the GOP-led bill does not do enough to help workers, leading to some heated scenes on the Senate floor. Democratic Minority Leader Chuck Schumer continues to try to negotiate with the Treasury Secretary behind the scenes. Our Mary Bruce has the latest from our nation's capital. Tonight on Capitol Hill, frantic negotiations over the nearly $2 trillion bill to rescue the American economy. We're very close to reaching a deal, very close. And our goal is to reach a deal today. But they're not there yet. Twice in 24 hours, Democrats have blocked the Republican bill, insisting it puts big businesses ahead of American workers and doesn't do enough to help families, health care workers and hospitals. But Republicans say Democrats are playing politics. This is not a juicy political opportunity. This is a national emergency. The bill would give millions of Americans a $1,200 check and $500 per child. But the biggest sticking point, a $500 billion relief fund for corporations. Democrats say it's a slush fund to dole out money with few strings attached. On the Senate floor today, anger and frustration. Is there objection? Thank you, Mr. President. I object. Oh, come on. I object. The Democratic leader this objection is This is unbelievable. Heard. You know what the American people are thinking right now, Mr. President? They're thinking that this country was founded by geniuses, but it's being run by a bunch of idiots. Congress tonight is racing the clock and the virus itself. Rand Paul, now the first senator and third member of Congress to test positive. More than a dozen lawmakers are in quarantine. Senator Amy Klobuchar's husband has tested positive and is in the hospital. The senator tweeting, I love him, and not being able to be by his side is one of the hardest things about this disease. The White House acutely aware of the staggering economic impact of social distancing. Our country wasn't built to be shut down. This is not a country that was built for this. 
The president with that all caps tweet, we cannot let the cure be worse than the problem itself. Trump's closest ally on the Hill, Senator Lindsey Graham, is strongly pushing back, tweeting when it comes to how to fight coronavirus, I'm making my decisions based on health care professionals, not political punditry. And Mary Bruce joins us now. Mary, we've rarely seen such heated scenes on the Senate floor. How are these tensions affecting getting to a deal? And where do negotiations stand now, given the time pressure to rescue the economy? Look, there is a lot of frustration and pressure and anxiety on Capitol Hill right now. Pe members are increasingly growing frustrated and fed up. So here's where things stand. Right now, the Treasury Secretary is literally shuffling back and forth between Mitch McConnell and Chuck Schumer's office, trying to work out this deal. They are optimistic, but they still aren't there yet. And they also are really eager to get those checks out to millions of Americans, those $1,200 checks. They're hoping that those will hit everyone's mailboxes sometime early next month. But bottom line, we simply don't know when this deal is going to get done and when Americans will see those payments. And Lindsay. we learned this weekend that Rand Paul became the first senator to test positive for COVID-19 and two other senators are now under self-quarantine. What kind of pressure is that putting on Congress to get a deal done? Look, they are racing a very serious clock here, not only because Congress wants to get relief to Americans and relief to the markets, but they are also really racing against this virus itself. There is a ticking time here. And members of Congress are working in very close quarters. They are not following a lot of the same precautions that all of us are practicing. Just, just taking a quick look at the Senate floor, and you can see that there's not a lot of social distancing going on right there. So they're trying to get this done as quickly as possible because the fear, of course, is that this Senate, the Capitol itself, could become uninhabitable if the disease continues to spread. They know they've got to get this done and in very short order. All right, Mary Bruce Forrest from our nation's capital. Thanks, Mary. And let's turn now to the White House, where the president said moments ago the daily coronavirus task force briefing that he's determined to make sure the economy is not crippled by COVID-19. ABC's Terry Moran joins us now. And Terry, we heard the president say that the cure can't be worse than the mm. problem. But is there any concern that the White House is putting reviving the economy and the stock market over following scientific and medical guidance? Well, there is, and that is the fundamental question before President Trump and really the leaders of nations around the world. The prospect of shutting down the American economy for months, shutting down society for months, is one the president has to take not just in terms of the public health issues and priorities uh, given this uh, pandemic, but also the economic and geostrategic problems, the, the consequences for American power. Every leader has to do that. And the transition to when it might be opening up is is really a question for every leader. President Trump wants to go now. He said weeks, not months. He said the consequences of an economic uh, uh, depression, which it, what, what it might be, uh, would be more death than the coronavirus itself. Epidemiologists might disagree. The real problem is preparing for the opening up. You need testing on a massive scale to see who's got it, who's safe to go out, where it's safe to go, where the outbreaks are, and where it's not. At the end of the day, though, Lindsay, it will be governors and mayors who still have the final say in their neighborhoods, and President Trump acknowledged that. And Americans still have so many questions on testing and what the government will do as this spread likely gets worse in the coming weeks. So what's your sense of how the White House is communicating its policies to the American people? Well, that has been a problem from the get-go. Look, you can go back and see President Trump's statements. He, he did shut down the border to China that bought the United States some time, but he said it would all go away. Stay calm, it will go away, he said. That, that is not what uh, any scientist would have told him. And up there now, you don't see uh, Dr. Anthony Fauci, who in an interview a couple of days ago said uh, that he was essentially trying to manage the president's misstatements on this. It, it, he is a instinctive communicator. He is not that careful. He's prepped uh, every day before, before the briefing. And what comes out during the briefing is often needed to be cleaned up by the scientists and the public health experts. Uh, so another problem in transitioning out of a lockdown is clarity and truthfulness from that podium. That has been a problem for this White House. Lindsay? That's right. Okay, Terry Moran, thank you so much for that update. We appreciate it. And when we come back, cases sadly continue to surge, not only here, but across Europe. And now the new concerns in Asia, several locations that appear to have controlled the virus are now seeing an uptick in cases. We are living in surreal times. New York at a near standstill.
Italy empty as governments take drastic measures. We'll take a look at these impacts on our personal freedoms. And our myth of the day, vitamin C and the coronavirus. Welcome back. It's still unclear where Italy is on that much talked about curve. More than 600 lives lost there in just the last 24 hours. That's less than the mine numbing nearly 800 who died on Saturday. But today's numbers are still shockingly high. In Spain, the situation now increasingly dire as the death toll there now spikes. And that's where our Ian Panel begins his report. Tonight, disturbing new images posted across social media in Spain showing patients on the floor of an overwhelmed hospital. <coughs> Victims heard coughing, some gasping for air, others apparently hooked up to oxygen tanks, doctors unable to keep up. Spain suffering over 460 deaths in the past 24 hours. And in Italy, another staggering day. Over 600 deaths today. My hospital, which is usually around 550 beds, now is dedicated 90% of this bed to, this, uh, to people, to patients uh, with, uh, with this uh, disease. But perhaps some light at the end of the tunnel for Italy. The percentage for total new infections rose 8%, single digits for the first time since this lockdown began two weeks ago. But the World Health Organization warning the pandemic is rapidly accelerating. It took 67 days from the initial reported infection to reach the first 100,000 cases, 11 days for the second 100,000, and just four days for the third 100,000. Here in Britain, PM Johnson addressed the nation tonight, saying all people should stay home from now on. Gatherings of two or more people not permitted. The UK death toll has soared by almost 50 in the last day, the rate of increase now mirroring exactly what happened in Italy two weeks ago, with this haunting warning to the nation from uh, one British patient. Please, none of you, take any chances. I mean it, because if it gets really bad... <laughs> ..then you're going to end up here. And Ian Panel joins us now. Ian, first talk to us about those new measures in the UK. I mean, it was just days ago, it seemed, that some were floating the concept of herd immunity, but not anymore. Yeah, that's right. What a difference just a few days makes when it comes to this virus. Uh, Britain has completely transformed. There was a very solemn address tonight from Prime Minister Boris Johnson. Um, he announced, in effect, the strictest measures that Britain has seen since the Second World War. Uh, I've never seen London like this. It's almost like the whole city has just been put on hold. It's really, really quiet tonight. And these new measures essentially are closing all non-essential stores. So the only ones that are really going to be allowed to remain open 
are grocers, supermarkets, those kinds of stores that are selling food to the public and also pharmacies. Every other business is now being ordered to close. Meetings of any greater than two people is now banned. So essentially, you can't meet your friends anymore and only one form of exercise a day is being allowed. Now, it isn't a total lockdown in the sense that some people will still be able to go to work and we've seen Italy struggle with that scenario. But nevertheless, these are really stringent measures and the police have powers to enforce them. Well, stringent indeed. Ian, you were reporting several weeks ago from Hong Kong and at the time it appeared that officials had a firm handle on the situation there. But now new cases there and in Singapore are causing some concern. Yes, that's right. Uh, kind of worrying development on one level because, of course, we've been looking at past case histories to try and work out what on earth we should do in America and in Britain uh, in terms of how we handle this. But actually what we saw was that when the Hong Kong authorities and in Singapore and Taiwan started to relax some of the restrictions that we're now all facing, that's when the number of cases started to spike again. So it was partly down to people coming into the country, foreigners, people coming from Europe, but it was also because of a lax, a, 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 a loosening of some of those restrictions on social gatherings. And I you know, have friends in Hong Kong and I've seen some of them posting pictures on Instagram. You can see they're going out and about. It's looking like life is returning to normal. And I think there's a real warning for all of us here. We may want this to be over with as quickly as possible, but there are clearly dangers in starting to loosen some of those restrictions. For sure. Now, many are hoping that the coronavirus is also kind of like a, a seasonal, like the flu, and that cases could dramatically lessen with warmer weather. But there's also been an uptick of cases in Thailand. Yes, that's right. In fact, I've been speaking to uh, former colleagues who were based in Thailand. Apparently, there was one big uh, national tournament uh, for kickboxing, which is national sport in Thailand. And people traveled from far and wide to the Lumpini Stadium in Bangkok, attended that. And that's when we saw this significant spike. So we've now seen businesses, restaurants starting to close in Bangkok. A lot of restrictions on movement. A lot of people going back to their villages, which isn't necessarily a good thing because that's how the virus spread. However, it's still worth saying, I remember when I started reporting in Hong Kong that Thailand had the biggest number of cases outside of China at the time. This was back at the end of January. Now, nobody talks about the figures in Thailand. They're still smaller. And again, if you look in Africa, yes, there is an uptick, but it still looks smaller. And the question is unanswered. But the question is, is that weather related in some way? We're all clinging on to some form of hope right now, right? Indeed, we are. Ian Panel, thank you for that report. And as we cling on to that hope, we still have a lot to get to tonight. With millions losing their jobs, some employers are hiring. We'll tell you who. And we'll hear from the many who have recovered from coronavirus, how their experiences can help shape our decisions on staying at home. But first, our tweet of the day. Senator Amy Klobuchar concerned about her husband, who has tested positive for COVID-19.
coronavirus pandemic is causing economic pain for so many American businesses. Some companies are booming and hiring. So let's take a look by the numbers. As Americans stock up on household basics, Dollar General announced today they'll hire up to 50,000 additional workers by the end of April for their 16,000 stores nationwide. CBS Health, the nation's largest pharmacy chain, will also add 50,000 full and part-time workers and will give cash bonuses up to $500 to existing in-store employees. Online grocery delivery company Instacart announced plans today to add 300,000 full-service shoppers over the next three months for grocery delivery and pickup. Online retail giant Amazon announced plans last week to add 100,000 warehouse and delivery workers and is boosting minimum pay by $2 an hour through April. Walmart is also adding 150,000 temporary hourly workers. And finally, with so many Americans now working remotely from home, video conferencing company Zoom is taking off. And while the stock market has dropped 10,000 points since February, Zoom has seen its stock rise from $70 a share in late January up to $160 a share today. And we still have a lot of news to get into tonight. An update on the story that we brought you last week. That international team of scientists has now mapped the coronavirus. How many existing medications could potentially help? The investigation's now underway. And who best to learn about how to keep yourself occupied while in isolation than an astronaut? But first, here are some of the trending stories on ABCnews.com. have a little different opinion about this. I thank my friend from West Virginia. I think the majority leader colleagues would benefit from understanding where we are. We've been fiddling around for two days. We don't have another day. We don't have another hour. We don't have another minute to delay. The motion is not agreed to. On Capitol Hill, Senate lawmakers voted down a procedure to take up a vote on a GOP-led stimulus bill. Earlier, Minority Leader Chuck Schumer said the GOP-led bill doesn't provide enough money for Americans and instead provides bailouts for corporations without assurances for workers. The Senate Republican bill put corporations first. The House is introducing a bill of its own to protect American workers, their incomes, and health care. In the coming days, several more states, including Massachusetts, Maryland, Michigan, and Indiana issuing stay-at-home orders, closing non-essential businesses, or both. Without aggressive additional measures, more people will get sick, 
more people will die and our economy will suffer longer. With New York already the epicenter of the outbreak in America, Governor Andrew Cuomo ordering hospitals to increase their capacity by 50% as the Army Corps of Engineers converts New York City's Javits Convention Center into a field hospital. This is a public health emergency. This is a matter of life and death. The economy we can fix. You can't remedy a loss of your health. You can't remedy loss of life. The UK stepping up its response to the novel coronavirus. Prime Minister Boris Johnson says it starts with banning gatherings of more than two people. The time has now come for us all to do more. Britain has the 10th highest number of COVID-19 cases worldwide. Pacific Gas and Electric agreeing to plead guilty to involuntary manslaughter after 85 victims died in the 2018 campfire that ripped through the town of Paradise, California. Investigators found it was started by the company's equipment. Many trying to escape the flames in their cars. There's explosions everywhere. Under the agreement with the Butte County District Attorney's Office, PG&E will pay the maximum fine of about $4 million. The severe weather threat tonight winter storm warnings and advisories from Pennsylvania up to Maine tonight. These images from Connecticut, some places a couple of inches of snow possible. To the south, damaging winds hail moving into the Tennessee Valley. Isolated tornadoes are possible. And as new cases continue to soar, more and more states have implemented or announced statewide closures for non-essential businesses. Right now, a total of 18 states are expected to be essentially shut down as of Tuesday. But another number that continues to climb is that of people who've recovered from COVID-19. Many of them are speaking out about the ordeal. Some of the message to those who are still at risk, especially young people. Here's ABC's Kaylee Hartung, who herself has recovered from a case she contracted while reporting in Seattle. Tonight, law enforcement threatening to crack down on people ignoring the warnings to stay apart. If you and your friends decide to throw a party at your home and you invite 20 of your closest friends, stop. Law enforcement officers will have to break that party up and there will be criminal consequences. From coast to coast, stunning images of large groups. In New York, crowds walking near the Hudson River and in Los Angeles, beaches packed with people. There are not enough people out there who are taking this seriously. I want America to understand this week it's going to get bad. The virus hitting America's youth in New York City. 46% of the cases in people 18 to 44. Nationwide, nearly half those flooding ICUs are 20 to 64. Uh, woke up in the middle of the night and had a lot of nausea. 26-year-old Fiona Lowenstein was diagnosed with COVID-19, hospitalized, and put on oxygen. So I definitely did not think that if I got hit with this, I would end up in the hospital. Dr. Anthony Fauci saying so far it's a mystery why it's impacting the young here, emphasizing the danger. We know that underlying conditions, all bets are off, no matter how young you are. The virus even sickening infants. Seven-month-old Emmett getting 103-degree fever. His mother, Courtney, trying to make sure it doesn't spread to her other children. Keep your babies at home, wash your hands. You know, it's hard to keep their little hands out of their mouths. While many are struggling in hospitals, roughly 100,000 worldwide have recovered. After returning home from covering the initial deadly wave in Washington state nursing homes, I felt symptoms. These aches all over my body. Right now I'm trying to figure out how to get tested and it's, it's unbelievably hard. I tested positive. I'm still isolating after recovering. Over the next four days, I got really bad. Clay Bentley spent 11 days in the hospital, had a fever, and could barely breathe. This is him today. Guys, I'm still at it, still going strong. And Kaylee joins us now. So first off, Kaylee, how are you feeling? I know that you had that really bad one day, but any other symptoms since we last spoke? Yeah, Lindsay, since we last spoke, it's been a little bit of a roller coaster. There was a day where my congestion was back in a big way. It was it was hard to breathe through my nose, but I don't want that to be mistaken for respiratory symptoms because I really didn't have any of those. This was just congestion. Um, this morning I woke up with a sore neck and immediately was like, oh my gosh, is this process starting all over again? But I, I genuinely think I just I just might have Slept a little the wrong tension way. there from the <laughs> stress of all of this and slept the wrong way. Exactly, exactly. But I really am, I am feeling better. I am feeling like I'm back to my old self. And I'd say it's been at this point about four days 
of that. So it's a good it's a good feeling. And do you know how long it will be until you can take yourself out of isolation and beyond that how you think this experience will affect once you've officially recovered? So it's a very good question, Lindsay, and, and right now I honestly don't know the answer and the experts who I've asked that same question to don't have clear guidance on what to tell me. So I actually got a call on Thursday, I believe it was, from an LA County public health nurse who said, you are now seven days, more than seven days at that point, past the onset of your symptoms. You have had improving condition for more than 72 hours and you haven't had a fever for more than 72 hours. So you're released from isolation. I heard this news, I couldn't believe it because initially I was told it was 14 days from the onset of the symptoms that I needed to be in isolation. So after a moment of just sort of a deep breath and a sigh of relief, I said, oh my goodness, I can't even believe it. So what does this mean now? Can I go back to work? You know, can I, can I walk to my street? Can I go to the grocery store? She says, well, we would like you to continue to quarantine and social distance until the pandemic is under control. So potentially weeks I or don't months? understand. Exactly, exactly. And I called our Dr. Jennifer Ashton and said, can you help me make sense of this? What does this mean practically? And she said, there are just so many unknowns. Right. These guidelines continue to change. And the only way that I will know for certain at this point that I am no longer a carrier of this virus is if I get tested again. Which is and I highly think you unlikely can understand, at this Lindsay, point, right? Exactly, yeah. exactly. And on that same phone call with LA County Public Health, they said, yes, well, you could get tested again, but we're not offering to test you. Right. You would need to find someone who could administer that test. And, and I have a problem, you know, sort of, sort of morally in all of this with asking for another test when I've already been so right. fortunate to get one when there are so many people out there begging for them. So, at this point, I feel, honestly, I, f I feel a little bit trapped in, in, in some form of purgatory, but I'm, I'm not interested in, and I, I don't see any reason to put anyone else at risk when in reality, all of us should be, should be hunkering down at home as much as we possibly can. And so I'm, I'm staying put for, yeah. for a, a, a while longer. That's a really interesting conundrum. And, and I appreciate you sharing with that, that with us because I think a lot of people, we just haven't gotten into that territory yet of, okay, at what point are right. you kind of released? So anyway, we hope that you continue to have a, a speedy and complete uh, recovery, Kaylee. And thank you so much for talking with us. Thank you, Lindsay. And tonight, an update on a story that we brought you last week. The scientists from uh, around the globe who have been mapping how the coronavirus attacks our body now say that they have found 69 drugs or compounds that could potentially treat it. On that list is the much talked about drug chloroquine. The virus targets the same protein that drug targets in treatment of malaria. Their findings explain scientifically what many doctors are seeing anecdotally, but one of the scientists on this worldwide collaboration rightly cautions that much more study needs to be done on this medication, and there may actually be better treatments on this list. COVID-19 targets several proteins that the scientists say that defy normal logic, but they hope this roadmap will help scientists search for treatments and ultimately a vaccine. And an Arizona man has died after ingesting chloroquine phosphate in an attempt to protect himself from COVID-19. His wife is now in critical care after ingesting it herself. Both of them are in their 60s. They use chloroquine phosphate, which is used to clean fish tanks. Officials say that people should not medicate themselves with chemicals that sound like medicine. And a reminder, much more study needs to be done before the FDA says that they can even consider approving the actual drug chloroquine for the coronavirus. And in these perilous times, many Americans are sacrificing their personal freedoms for the common good. Tonight, one out of three Americans is under government orders to stay at home, and at least 17 states have ordered non-essential businesses to close. In some states, large gatherings are altogether banned. But how far can the government go in taking away our civil liberties? And could we see here in the United States more extreme restrictions like those in China and parts of Europe? Our Maggie Rooley has that story. For a few days now, Americans have seen surreal scenes play out in their backyards. Entire cities on lockdown. The Navy and National Guard deployed. 
flights canceled, borders tightened. Not within most people's lifetime. Um, has there been anything, has there been anything similar to this? As COVID-19 rips around the world, America finds itself having to make startling decisions. Public health disaster. Normal is not in our game plan. Stay home. And maintain social distancing. In times like these, even our civil liberties, the bedrock of our constitution, can be restricted as we potentially enter uncharted legal waters. Liberties are being tested. What is really important, even in times such as this, that governments not go overboard. And that's the real test. When China was first hit with the new coronavirus back in December, its totalitarian government responded with regional crackdowns. We watched as populated cities went dark and saw the consequences when people disobeyed orders. <laughs> At the time, it felt like their policies could never be implemented here. China is a communist country, America is a democracy. But China's quarantine measures seem to have worked for now. Their reported number of domestic cases is down to nearly zero. But now that the U.S. is facing a daily surge of new cases, governments are imposing rules that are changing the day-to-day -day lives of Americans. Be a good neighbor, be a good citizen. Those young people that are still out there on the beaches uh, thinking this is a party, eh, time to grow up. You know, time to wake up. Ordering non-essential businesses to close their doors. Shuttering schools. Leaving many families to wonder how they're going to make ends meet. What about the little guy? It's a fine line officials are treading as they jeopardize many people's livelihoods. So what are the laws during a pandemic? The states have broad powers to quarantine and ban large gatherings. And President Trump can completely close the U.S. border, but his power to quarantine has limits. And when he declared a national emergency under the Stafford Act, it just gives him the power to redirect federal funds and resources. It was not a call for martial law. But it's easy to see how people can be alarmed. We saw Europe close its borders. Major cities are completely shutting down, something that hasn't happened since World War II. In some countries, people have been fined just for being outside. Nous sommes en guerre. And countries are increasingly using technology to keep close tabs on their citizens' movements. In South Korea, officials used surveillance and credit card data to track down those infected. And in Italy and Israel, governments are following potential patients using their cell data. There have been times across history where the government has quickly turned to health as being its wedge issues in order to carry out what would otherwise be a political agenda. But in the U.S., we might see pushback against too many restrictions on civil liberties, and it could be up to individuals and the courts to keep the government in check. That it's not unpatriotic to hold our government accountable. But we know that there are times in which a state may overreach, and it's courts then that we turn to. Maggie Ruley, ABC News, London. Our thanks to Maggie. With schools shutting down due to concerns over the COVID-19 outbreak, parents are now turning their living rooms into classrooms. But what about those parents whose paychecks can't stretch far enough to afford the luxury of at-home Wi-Fi? A group of mothers in Orlando are banding together by trying, sharing things like Wi-Fi and taking turns watching one another's children to help their children push ahead even as the world around them feels upside down. So I was kind of nervous because um, my kid was worried about internet, Wi-Fi, whatever. You know, we didn't have it at first, you know. So I sent her to my sister's house for a little while, and me and my neighbors, you know, we kind of got together and we said, okay, how could we, you know, do something? So me and my next-door neighbor and the lady, I think, that lives with her, um, all band together and said, okay, we're just going to go ahead and make sure that you know, the kids have internet, we're going to pay for it. My neighbor, and my name is Dorothy Miracle, and I'm here from Atlanta, Florida, and I drive for Lyft. Right. And um, we were talking about coronavirus and how um, her work, you know, she doesn't have work anymore. Lyft is not going very well at all. I've been home for, like, uh, going on my second week. I had to leave Lyft because of the coronavirus, because I didn't want to bring it in to my grandkids, as well as I didn't want to be sick myself. This is Jamesca, Miss Dorothy's daughter, and... Uh, um, she drops her kids off every morning. Yes, yeah, so I drop my son off because I have to still work even though my job is still open. Thankfully, my job is still there so that I can work still. 
and hopefully we can last a little longer because I work for a restaurant, so we may end up shutting down. Right. But thank God for my mom, I have somewhere to take my kids so that I could work the little three, four hours that I'm still able to work now. It's real hard without the work, but we are kind of like managing it, and I just thank God for my neighbor, Amber. You know, we always been there for one another through the years anyway, but this is really is. So this is my daughter, Caitlin. She just got home, and um, <laughs> she just found out she'll be going to school at home. <laughs> and I got the Wi-Fi fixed, so. Uh, so I can. Yeah, you're going to school here. I know! <laughs> super, it's super. I know, it's super exciting. I'll show you where it is, and uh, we're gonna go from there. Okay. Oh my God. To Amber Robertson and all those other moms, we salute you, thank you, and good luck to you. So how do you manage life in isolation? Well, astronaut Scott Kelly spent nearly a year living on the International Space Station, and he shared these tips earlier with Robin and George. We've only been in isolation for a very short amount of time. You were in it for so much longer. How was it? Well, you know, it's not easy, right? But I think if you have the right expectations, if, uh, and in my case, when I flew to the space station, I was, I knew how long I was going to be there, but it was so far away into the future that my expectations were, you know, this is where I live now. And uh, I have to deal with it, and someday it will be over. And I think that's what people need to have that kind of mindset. And we all know it's going to be over at some point, but you, as you just said, you knew how long you were going to be there. Everyone dealing with it now doesn't. Yeah, you know, that's uh, that kind of uncertainty can, uh, you know, be stressful and and uh, a challenging thing to live with. But, um, you know, we can get through this if we work together, if we support each other, if we stay connected. You know, there's a lot of things you can do in isolation that can make it a lot easier. From a from a practical standpoint, point, what are your top tips for getting through the day to day of being in isolation? Well, the first thing, like I said, is have the right expectations. Since we don't know how long this is going to be, you know, you have to think, hey, this is this is my new reality. This is where I live. I'm going to be here for who knows how long. And um, I'm going to take it very, very seriously. And those things are having a schedule. A schedule is so very important. When I got to space the first time I was on a long flight, it was hard to get used to that, you know, being scheduled five minutes at a time, sometimes an hour, sometimes an hour for eight hours if it was a spacewalk. But I found as I got used to it, I actually needed it. Mm. And when I got home, I missed it. So having a schedule is critical to helping us get through this. So you need to schedule things like work, rest, taking care of your environment, you know, your space station, whether that's the, uh, the house you live in, the apartment that you live in, you know, take time to go outside if you can. Uh, sunlight and nature is so very, very important to our health our health. And you also mentioned writing in a journal. That's something that other people have thought would be very helpful as well. Why? Well, you know, you put your feelings in a journal. And uh, if you're feeling a certain way, writing it down, being honest with yourself about it is the best possible thing you can do. And then when this is all over someday, you know, we can look back at this time, one of the most challenging times in our country, and you can have a record of what it was like mm. for you. And what you did, did you, uh, you know, were you helpful? Did you rise to the occasion? Hopefully, you know, that'll be the case for everyone. But if you didn't, you know, at least you have that outlet. Yeah. You know, something to do on a daily basis that's part of this regular schedule of getting through this. Note to self, write a journal. And when we return, the much needed good news that we all could use. Feel very, uh, very at ease. 
But now if I find out I have to stay inside again for so another 14 <laughs> days. But that's well, just okay. for the shelter in place. I got lots of washing and cooking to do, and, and it'll be nice. It will be fine. How do you feel, Papa? Feel good. <laughs> I'm gonna go find my cat. I gotta go home still. So. Oh, okay. Okay. Bye bye. We're doing well. We all tested negative, so yep, we're got very happy. Love the grandfather saying, I feel good. And they all tested negative, so some good news there. And again, those are our friends, Michelle Heckerter and her grandparents. They are finally finished with their 14-day quarantine after their trip on the Grand Princess cruise ship. They had to detour through Travis Air Force Base, which we followed them through. And they are now healthy and happy to be back home in the Bay Area, but have new challenges to face not being able to prepare for life uh, as it is now. And finally tonight, there are so many stories to tell of people coming together to give others a reason to smile in these challenging times. So James Longman, take it away. Hi guys, it seems like the coronavirus measures are getting stricter and stricter every day, but at the same time, stories of hope and survival are also on the increase. And with the numbers of fatalities being reported the whole time, it's easy to lose sight of the fact that the overwhelming number of people who get coronavirus recover from it. Right, so our good news roundup for this week. We're starting off with this couple in southwest Colorado. They have paid for the testing for their entire community. Check it out. I had a chat with them. Uh, what have people said to you? Are people stopping you on the street? I mean, it, it must be a real relief to your community that you're doing this. And when we announced it to uh, some of the, the medical staff, um, you know, people were, were crying. I think really people just want to know that you care and that they were able to do something, they were able to get information. I think one of the, the hardest parts about this pandemic is not knowing. Part of why we did this was, you know, we have the tools to be able to offer it, so I think everyone wants to help each other. This is really a time that community is trying to look out for each other. Virtually everybody here in our community immediately has been just overwhelmingly supportive, and it's humbling and it's, it's amazing. And I think that, you know, even though we're far apart, it doesn't mean that we have to feel far apart. It means that it's the ultimate example and the, the exact right time to, to walk softly and be kind and to operate from a position of, of love. What an incredible thing to do. Now, music, as we've seen, has brought people together during this crisis. But this week, we've seen some pretty amazing singing. to surprise the residents with the special guests. We need to remind them they're not alone in this building. Alvis has not left the building. Uh-huh. Just doing all right. You ain't nothing but a hell of a girl. Hell of a girl. Birthday to you. And a family not letting distance stop a 95th birthday celebration. Just look at the smile on this lady's face. So best wishes to her and everybody else who might be celebrating a birthday in these trying times. Now, if you're trying to keep in shape during this crisis, how is this for inspiration? A French runner ran an entire marathon on his balcony this week. It took Elisha Notchomovitz seven hours to do this, and he said he did it as a thank you to health workers around the world. And just because our favorite gyms have closed, it doesn't mean that our favorite workouts have to end. Come on, come on. I can do this, go on, go on. Six, five, four, three, two, one. Get up, don't sit down, don't sit down. I could not think of a better place to be except for back in this red room with all of you virtually. So it might be the chance to try something new. And just a quick tip, if you are using online health guides from trainers on Instagram and elsewhere, it might be worth dropping them a note to get their bank details. Remember, a lot of these guys are self-employed and without their gyms open, that's the stream of income they're losing out on. So it might be nice to do that for them. And we have loved people's home videos from all over the world. Check out our favorite selection of people's choreographed home dance routines. Check it out.
So that was your good news roundup of the week. We want to leave you with the beautiful voice of Neil Diamond. He's transformed Sweet Caroline into a public service announcement. Hands, washing hands, reaching out, don't touch me, I won't touch you. Definitely words for all of us to live by. Stay safe and be good to each other. Thank you, James, and thank you to all of you for keeping us laughing and dancing and smiling throughout. And before we go tonight, the image of the day, which hopefully will make you smile as well. This grandfather in County Meath, Ireland, met his newborn grandson through a window over the weekend. Proud dad Michael held up baby Fuelon to make the introduction while all three generations practice social distancing. We know it'll be extra special when he finally gets to hold his grandson in his arms. Thanks to Emma and Dylan Gallagher for this photo of her family. And that is our show for this hour. Be sure to stay tuned to ABC News Live for more context and analysis of the day's top stories. I'm Lindsay Davis. Thanks so much for streaming with us. Good night.